uh, a specific challenge that the Lord helped you overcome and thank him for it this morning. So let's pause here, think of what we can be thankful of, and then we'll pray and go right into the message. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning just for who you are. I thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. And I'm so thankful that you sh you started in the beginning. You had this plan from the very beginning, even though you knew that Adam and Eve would fall and sin. You knew that we would fail all along the way, but you sent a redeemer just for that reason, Father. We thank you for it. We thank you for the rain today. We thank you for the way that you've been protecting our church through this time of, of COVID. Uh, we, we just praise you that we've not had any serious cases or anything like that. Father, you've blessed us so much in that way. And we just ask that you would continue to help our church to grow, both in number, but also more importantly in maturity uh, in, in spiritual matters. Father, challenge us in only the way that you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 2. We have finally made it through the first chapter. We are in John chapter 2, and uh, I think I was counting it up the other day. I think this is message number 6, so it took us five messages to get through chapter number 1. But that's okay, we're learning a lot, we're learning a lot. John chapter 2 this morning, as we look at a very familiar passage of Scripture, we're going to look at the miracle at the marriage today. And we're going to look at the miracle at the marriage here in John chapter 2. In March 2004, dozens of rescuers were looking for 39 Boy Scouts and their troop leaders who were trapped by tons of snow. An avalanche in the high country of Utah's Logan Canyon had covered the Scouts, and 64 mile an hour winds made rescue efforts extremely difficult. Ironically, the trapped scouts slept comfortably through the entire ordeal. The group had carved out caves deep into the snow, bunkering in for the night. And when the avalanche occurred around 4 a.m., the sleepers inside had no idea that they were buried under six to eight feet of snow. The snow caves insulated the group from the sound, from wind, and the knowledge that they were even in trouble. You're pretty cozy inside of them, said Randy Maurer, the father of one of the scouts. He said, you're completely oblivious to what's going on outside. Thankfully, two of the scout leaders were sleeping in a nearby trailer. They heard the storm, the avalanche. They called for emergency help. The county sheriff's spokesman said that probably made quite a bit of noise, I'm imagining. But if they would have all been in the caves, I shudder to think how long it would have been before we had heard about this uh, this news. Instead, rescuers quickly found the scouts' location, jabbing probes into the snow, working, uh, waking them to the news that they'd been rescued from danger that they knew nothing about. It's interesting, this rescue that, Hank, that came. And here we are this morning in a passage of Scripture where we see one of the most famous Bible stories involving a young couple at their marriage that needed a rescue. While they enjoyed the celebration of their marriage, Jesus was taking care of a rescue uh, that needed to take place at the reception that they had. Let's read this morning here in John chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. That, that word wanted there, that really all it means is they ran out. It doesn't mean that people were sitting there calling for more wine. Uh, it, it means they ran out. So you could say it like this, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said unto them, they have no wine. Verse 4, Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Let me stop right there as well. Jesus here is not being disrespectful to Mary when he says this. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Number one, a man calling a female woman 
was not a degrading thing in that day and age. It was not a, a, uh, an uncommon thing in that day and age uh, for, a, for a male to refer to a female as woman. Uh, so it's not a demeaning thing at all. He's not being disrespectful to his mother when he says this, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. What he's doing here most likely is he is reminding Mary of what he's really there to do. He's there to do the will of the Father. He knows what Mary's asking. When Mary comes to Jesus, you know, she could have gone to the governor of the feast. She could have gone to the person who was in charge of handling all of the food and the drink. But she goes to Jesus. Folks, we're going to say this a little bit later, but let me just go ahead and say it. Times of want, times of need, times of trouble, when you don't know what else to do, follow Mary's example, go to Jesus, go to Jesus, we'll hit that one again, but she comes to Jesus and Jesus tells her, what have I to do with thee? My hour, he's basically, I'm here to do God's will. He's reminding her probably of uh, the time when he was 12 and got left at the temple and of course Mary and Joseph come back and they're frantically looking for Jesus and uh, where were you? And he reminds them, and here again, as a 12-year-old boy, he wasn't being disrespectful, but he's saying, would you not know that I must be about my father's business? He's reminding her, I'm doing the will of the father. Here's something else that, that is being pointed out here, I believe, is that he's reminding her that, listen, the miracles that will get done, the work that Jesus would do, the miracles of God don't come on command of our requests. He does miracles as God wills. God does miracles in our lives as He will, not on my request. Okay? So there again, that kind of puts to, puts to bed the mindset that God is my genie in a bottle. Okay? I'm not going to rub my Bible and I get three wishes granted. Okay? It's not the way it works. And so that's what Jesus is doing here. He's, he's reminding Mary... I'm here to do God's will. Mine hour has not yet come. It's not, it's not time for a whole lot to be announced and introduced yet in Jesus' ministry. You realize here, He hasn't called all 12 disciples. Uh, he has yet to really, He has yet to display publicly any form of miracle. And even here, it's not necessarily a full public miracle that takes place here. This is something that happens behind the scenes. So he's not, his hour's not yet come. It's, the world's not ready to understand exactly who Jesus is quite yet. And he's not ready quite yet. It's not time for him to let everyone know, this is who I am. Let's keep going. Verse number 5, His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set... There are six water pots of stone, after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, which was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants withdrew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. We have here again a very, very familiar story, a very familiar passage of Scripture. When we think about the miracle here, and we look down at verse 11 that we just read, whenever we see Jesus did a miracle, it was to show us who He is. Every single time, without exception, when Jesus did a miracle, it was to show people who He is as the Son of God. And it that purpose of that was to lead people to believe in Him as the Son of God. So, and remember this, the only way to heaven has 
always been and will always be belief in Jesus. Belief through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here in this passage of Scripture, is he is pointing those who would see and know about what's happening here to himself as the Son of God and to lead them to belief in him. Let's, we're going to look here in this passage, and we're going to dive through, and we're going to see some things that we can learn from this miracle at the marriage this morning. Things that we can learn from this miracle at the marriage. First thing is this. It teaches us about marriage. It teaches us about marriage. As we think about this, and we dive in, we see here in the, in the first verse, in the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. You know, Jesus came, he sanctioned this marriage. The verse says that he was invited to a marriage. It doesn't say the word wedding. You say, Pastor, you're playing semantics here. Maybe. But, I looked it up. The Greek word that's used here, translated in our Bibles as marriage, is actually the common translation of this Greek word. In Bible times, in ancient Koine Greek times, the common translation of the word that is used here is marriage, not necessarily wedding. Wedding is used very few times uh, to be from this word. I don't think it's a mistake that the word here is the word marriage. Here's why I, I don't think that it's a mistake. See, many people have a lot to, about Jesus in their wedding. They'll get married in a church. They'll have a pastor perform the ceremony. They will have... Uh, all these things about Jesus in their wedding. But a wedding is an event. A marriage is a lifelong thing. We'll have Jesus at our wedding, but many people, when they walk out the door and head to their honeymoon, they leave Jesus in the church, and they forget about Jesus in their marriage. Folks, the fact is that we've got to keep Jesus in our marriage. We've got to keep Jesus in our marriage. Holly and I will celebrate in March our 19th anniversary. And I think she would agree with me on this statement. I'm going to put her on the spot. We have a happy marriage. I believe we have a wonderful marriage and a wonderful relationship. Why is that? Because Holly and I have tried to keep Jesus in our marriage. We've made that a priority in our lives. I've counseled couples, pre-marriage counseling. I've done counseling after people get married, when they're having struggles in their marriage. And I'm always reminding couples You've got to keep Jesus, you've got to keep God in a priority place in your marriage. I would use the old triangle illustration when I would do pre-marriage counseling. You have God at the top and you have the two couples on the corners and as the couple individuals grow closer to God, they're going to grow closer together. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. You've got to keep Jesus in your marriage. John MacArthur writes this, he said, by attending a wedding and performing his first miracle there, Jesus sanctified both the institution of marriage and the ceremony itself. You realize it's a sacred thing to stand and unite with one another before God and man. That's a sacred thing that God has established. God established marriage. Marriage, he MacArthur continues to state, marriage is the sacred union of a man and a woman whereby they become one in the sight of God. The ceremony is an essential element of that union because in it the couple publicly vow to remain faithful to each other. Jesus came to a wedding. Jesus performed a miracle there. Jesus was putting his stamp on, on marriage. Folks, we need to allow Jesus to put a stamp on our marriage. 
me say this before we move on. You know, we see Jesus' sanction of marriage. Marriage only works when Jesus is involved. Marriage only works when Jesus is involved. So with that in mind, we move on to what else we learn about marriage here. We, we learn that Jesus sanctions marriage, but we see that Jesus has a supply for our marriage. Here we see in this passage, we see a cultural nightmare happens. Cultural nightmare happens when the supplies run out. They ran out of wine. This was the cultural faux pas of all faux pas, if you will. To fail to provide adequately for guests would have been a social disgrace to this couple. This would have been something in these closely knit communities that, of Jesus' day that this couple would, would never live down. This would not have been forgotten. This was one of the biggest days of their entire life, one of the biggest events of their entire life, and they would be forever marked as the couple who failed to provide for their guests. You think about that. What a, what a pain that would haunt this newly married couple. It wouldn't be that, oh, do you remember our wedding day? It would be, oh, do you remember our wedding day? It's kind of a mindset. Nobody would want that. I mean, that's, that's what they're looking at here. And they were in a place, they lacked something that only Jesus could supply. Again, I, I said it already, I don't think it's any mistake that Jesus or Mary didn't go to anybody else but Jesus when she realized we've got a problem. Because Mary understood. Mary understood. I've got a problem. I've got to go to Jesus. I've got to go to Jesus. They lacked something that only He could supply. I'm thinking about your marriage. You may be struggling with your marriage. There may be issues that you're facing right now, challenges in your marriage that you're facing today. Let me remind you, Jesus is the answer to those struggles. Jesus is the only answer for those struggles. When we do things the way the Bible tells us, they work. How do I know that doing things the Bible way is the only way to do things or is the best way to do things? Because from my experience in my life, when I do things the way the Bible says to do them, they just work. When I try to do things my way, it doesn't work. But when I do it God's way, it works. Folks, if, are you struggling in your marriage today? Is, are there issues that you're battling in your marriage today? Do it God's way. Do it God's way. Allow Jesus to supply you what you need in your marriage. When it comes to marriage, when it comes to children, when it comes to finances, etc. We could go on and on with this list. No matter what it comes to in your life, understand that God can do miracles in that area. God can do miracles in your marriage. Jesus stepped in at this wedding and He did a miracle. The Bible doesn't tell us whether or not this couple ever knew that Jesus did this. But they had Jesus there. They had Jesus as part of their marriage. Are we keeping Jesus as part of our marriage? Are you allowing Him to supply you with what you need Folks, life, life hits. We all know this. I, I talk about the wonderful marriage I have. That doesn't mean there haven't been bumps along the way. We have, Holly and I have not always agreed. Okay. Our last name is not Brady. <laughs> okay. 
We do not always agree on everything. There have been arguments, disagreements. But Jesus always has to come around and be the answer and the solution to solve those issues. Our kids are not perfect. Our kids are not perfect. Lily would like you to think that she is, but our kids are not perfect. (laughs) They're far from it. So how do we deal with it when we have struggles with our children? Jesus. We go to Jesus. That's the only place. That's the only thing I can do. Let Jesus be your supply in your marriage. Notice verse number 5, the greatest advice ever given. The greatest advice ever given comes from Mary in verse number 5. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Whatever Jesus is saying to you from his word, open your Bible and find the greatest advice you will ever get. Follow what Jesus says. Pastor, I'm struggling. My wife and I are having a hard time. I understand. I really do understand. Open your Bible and get the advice from God's Word. Get the encouragement and the supply you need from God's Word. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. I've counseled so many people and the answer has simply been, husbands, love your wives. I've talked to fellow pastors who are struggling in their marriage relationship and the issue has been they haven't truly loved their wives and they haven't treated them as we're instructed in Scripture to treat them as vessels unto honor. Husbands? I have a little rant here. This isn't in my notes. Husbands? Your wife is the most valuable treasure in your home. Notice I didn't say that you possess. Okay? It's important. It's the most valuable treasure in your home is your wife. Treat her as such. We take care of our vehicles. We take care of our things. Our, all, these, all this stuff. Take care of your wife. Husbands, date your wives. Date your wives with the intensity that you did when you wanted to get her to marry you. Date your wives. Love your wives. Wives, honor your husbands. Listen, this is not a him lording over you thing. Marriage is a partnership. Holly and I are in this together. It's not me and Holly falling in line behind me. We are in this together. I could not do this without her. Wives, your husband needs your support. Your husband needs you to love and support. Hey, we have this, we have this thing where we men need to get on an ego trip every now and then, and we need our wives to boost us every now and then in our egos. Sometimes our wives have to uh, knock our egos down a little bit, but <laughs> but uh, we need that. There's husbands love and honor your wives, wives honor your husbands, love them. It's important. How do I know that works because that's what the Bible teaches us. It's not that I have found the miracle for the wonderful marriage. Well, I have. It's the Bible. The Bible is the miracle for having a wonderful marriage. Sticking to what it tells me. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. It teaches us about marriage. Jesus' miracle here. Secondly, this morning, it teaches us about Jesus. It shows us Him. Isn't that the purpose of this whole Gospel of John? To show us who Jesus is? And to help us believe in Him as the Son of God? It teaches us a couple things about him, about Jesus. Verses 6 through 10, we see the miracle take place. 
first thing we see is Jesus is good. Jesus is good. Remember that. Never forget that. We don't know the names of these people that got married. We know very little about them. We can make assumptions and guesses about these people. A lot of commentators quickly comment on this as to why Jesus and the disciples would have been invited. You can take it a little bit deeper in your thought processing. Why would Mary be the one coming and asking about Jesus needing to do something about it? Maybe she was involved helping with it. Could be that they were close family friends of Mary and Jesus. Could be that they were family. We don't know. These are, to us, they're people who are obscured to eternity and are, we don't know. What we do know is that Jesus cared enough to help them. Why? Because he's good. Because Jesus is good. He cares about individuals. Jesus knows where you are in life. He knows about where you are in life. And guess what? He cares about you as an individual. He cares about you. Scripture tells us that God knows the number of hairs on our head. I often joke that with me, he's counting down. He knows the number of hairs on our head. That's knowledge of someone. If he cares so much about a sparrow that falls from the tree, how much more does he care about you as an individual? Jesus is good. Here he comes to this insignificant wedding in a small place with people we don't even know who they are. It doesn't, scripture doesn't even take the time to tell us who they are, relation or whatever, but they have a problem. And Jesus is good. He recognizes the problem and he does something about it. You think about how good God has been to you. I think we need to do this a lot more often. This probably ought to become an everyday occurrence in our life. Step back and think about what God has given us. He's given us life. I'm here this morning. He's given us family. He's given us so much good that we do not deserve. We talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night, talking about praise and our prayers. God has given us so much to praise Him for and to thank Him for. And I praise God that He has not given us what we do deserve. Because He's good. The fact that Jesus works to remedy this situation here at the wedding reminds us that He's concerned with even the everyday things in life that we face. Think about whatever it may be that you're facing, that to you may seem insignificant. I know there's a lot of people that say, oh, I know I probably ought to pray about it, but it's not that big a deal. But Jesus cares about it. Jesus cares about it. There is no situation, no circumstance, no nothing in your life that is too small to bring before God. What does the Bible say? Casting all your care upon Him for He cares for you. It doesn't say, only bring the significant things of life to me because I care about those. He says, cast all your care on Him. God is good. Jesus is good. This passage here shows us that Jesus came to a wedding feast ready to help remedy a situation. Jesus came to the rescue of this marriage. He's a good God. We need to remember that about him. We see that Jesus is good, but we also learn about Jesus here that he is great. He is great. Now we're going to talk about the miracle a little bit. Notice here in verse 6, it says, And there were set there six 
water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew, and the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, saith unto him, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worst, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So Jesus has before him, get the picture in your mind here, he has six water pots in front of him. These six water pots would have measured about 20 to 30 gallons each. These are huge water pots. Now these water pots were set aside for the purpose of cleansing. Okay, So this was a religious thing, this was a ceremonial thing, a traditional thing that the Jews would have followed at things like this. These water pots would have been used for things like foot washing. Some of them would have been used for uh, purifying of cooking utensils and serving utensils and things like that. Okay, So they're there for a specific reason. Understand in the Jewish law and the Jewish ceremonies, these water pots would have never been used for anything but water. So to those people who would say, oh, this miracle... What it was was the water picked up the taste from previous, the residue from previous wine that had been in these water, in these pots. That's, he didn't really turn water into wine, he just put water in there and it all mixed up together and that's how they got the taste. Wrong. These were pots that never held anything other than water in them. So Jesus took these pots that were used just for water. And he does the miraculous. He changes the water to wine. Completely changed. Could you imagine being the servant carrying that cup that had just seen these pots filled with water? And he's told to dip out of the water and carry it to the governor of the feast. Can you imagine me and that servant dipping that out and carrying that going, I am going to take this guy water and what am I doing? <laughs> the governor's going to kick me out. Can you imagine? And then the governor tasting it and exclaiming what he did about how good it was. Just like the, the mindset that had to be running on there, going on there, had to be absolutely amazing. Jesus did the miraculous. And we don't know how he did it. If he just had him fill the water and poof, it happened. Or if he dipped his hand in the water, if he prayed over it. I, we don't know. That doesn't matter. What we know is it happened. Now let me stop and say this, okay? Because this is a passage where this is oftentimes going to come up. This passage right here, these verses are often used to justify the consumption of alcohol. People will say, see, Jesus turned water into wine. On the other side of that argument, people will often do, hear me on this, people will do exegetical acrobatics with this passage to try to prove the other side of this. So you got one side trying to say it's okay, you got one side trying to say it's not okay from this passage. So who's right? Who's right? Let me tell you, neither one is right from this passage, trying to make either argument. Neither one is right. John MacArthur did say this about, about the wine that, that was created. He said, surely it was the sweetest, freshest wine ever tasted. This wine did not come from the normal process of fermentation, from grapes, vines, the earth, and sun. The Lord brought it into existence from nothing. Truly, this was evidence that He is the Creator. He is great. But here, folks, get this. This is important that we latch on to this about this passage of Scripture. It's not about the wine. 
it's not about the wine. If you're focusing on the wine in this passage to prove whatever point it is you're trying to prove, you are missing the entire point of this passage of Scripture. It's not about the wine. It's not about the wine. You you may be sitting there right now saying, Pastor, are you going to tell us what you think about this? No, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you. Because that's not the point of this passage of Scripture. That's for another time. Let's focus in on what is being communicated here. It's not about the wine. It's about the miracle. It's about the person who performed the miracle. It's all about Jesus. It's about pointing people to who Jesus is as the Son of God and trusting Him for salvation. That's what this is all about. Don't forget John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, the theme verses for the entire book of John. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, why? Why? that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. It's all about Jesus. Stop making this passage about an insignificant little side note. It's about Jesus. Stop justifying or trying to turn over somebody's beliefs from this passage. It's not about that. We're missing the whole point. I've heard pastors preach entire messages on this. And when I started diving into this, I'm like, oh, how am I going to address this? How am I going to address It's not about that. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And Jesus did something here that was absolutely amazing because He is great. Folks, listen. Jesus took water and made wine out of it. Imagine what He can do in you. Imagine what He can do through you. He took insignificant water pots and used them to accomplish a greater purpose. Folks, he can take insignificant water pots and do the miraculous in us and through us to accomplish a greater purpose. And what is that greater purpose? To point people to himself. To point people to himself. Jesus is great. And he can do the miraculous in your life. And through your life. Don't ever discount what God can do. I stand here today as a testimony of what God can do in the life of an individual. Who who is Stephen Ashmore? I'm just a guy. I'm just a water pot. Listen, I... I don't get invited to preach at all the, these big conferences and all these things. I can't say that I've preached worldwide because I did go on missions trips. But I'm, not, I'm, I'm just nobody. But in Christ, who can do great things because He is great, I am somebody who has an opportunity to share Jesus Christ with the world. But every single one of us in this room are that. Every single one of us. You may be sitting here and you may be able to be saying, like Moses, well, I don't talk so good. Look what God did through Moses. You may be sitting here saying, well, who am I? Well, you may be like Gideon. Gideon, I am the least of the least of my brethren. I am like... You find the bottom rung of the ladder, and I'm about six feet below that. That's basically what Gideon was saying. I'm nobody, but look what God did through Gideon. 
Go to the end of Hebrews chapter 11 and you will see countless people who aren't even named that did amazing things for God. Because God is great. Because Jesus is great and can and wants to do the miraculous in your life. Do you believe that he can? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you trusted him for salvation and given your life to him to do the miraculous in your life? I'm just an empty water pot. Jesus, fill me. Make me useful. That's the best we can do. It's just turn ourselves over to him to do. Lastly here this morning, this teaches us about salvation. It teaches us about salvation. First thing it teaches us here is that Jesus, when Jesus came, Jesus abolished dead religion. Jesus abolished dead religion. Think about verse number six here again. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews. These water pots, 20 to 30 gallon water pots, were carved out of a single piece of stone, and the Jews believed that if something was carved out of stone, pure stone, that it was pure. That's why they used these water pots specifically for the purpose of cleansing. It was a spiritual ritual that they did based off of Old Testament law. Jesus shows up. He he doesn't take the pots that they had already used for wine to fill them. He chooses the water pots that were used for the religious cleansing. You catching what I'm saying here? Jesus came and abolished dead religion. Folks, they're just water pots. They're just water pots. This building here, it's just a water pot. The pew you're sitting in, it's just a water pot. This pulpit's just a water pot. Your church attendance is just a water pot. Your membership of this church is just a water pot. Your Sunday school attendance is just a water pot. It's not about those things. Membership, tithes and offerings, Sunday school attendance, church attendance, all just water pots. It's all about Jesus. Jesus came and upset the norm. He brought a difference. He brought a way of life, a new way of living. He took what had been made sacred, a water pot, and he used it for something. It ain't never been done that way before. You know, the Baptist motto. We ain't never done it that way before. He completely changed. It's probably why he did this miracle where most people didn't see what was going on. Because you imagine the, the religious rulers would have had a fit the Pharisees would have had a fit. How dare you do that to those water pots? I've heard people say the same thing about, how dare you do that in a church auditorium? It's a water pot. That doesn't belong in church. It's a water pot, people. Jesus brought change. Jesus brought something different. Jesus came and did away with the law and tradition. Jesus brought change. He brought something different that takes our religious life to a deeper place, to a relationship with him. Life in Christ, not dead works. We've been so stuck on, we've got to do it this way and this way and this way and this way and this way. And in this formalism, hear me. You've got to do things this way. You've got to use a particular kind of music, and you've got to have a particular order of service, and you can only get your Sunday school material from this publisher, and you have to do da-da-da-da-da-da-da. None of that is found in the Bible. 
It's dead works. It's water pots. Jesus came and did away with all of that. It's all about Jesus. And we've got to stop putting all of these other things in the way of Jesus. Jesus did away with all of that. He abolishes dead religion. Folks, He did that so we would know that the only way we get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You don't have to jump through hurdles. You don't have to become a member of this church. You don't have to get your life all worked out and organized in order to come to Christ. Come to Him as you are. You can't get all of that stuff in order without Him. Come as you are. Jesus does away with all of that and says, just come. Come and see, as we talked about last week. Come to me, Jesus calls. And Christians, you can tell I get a little hot under the collar about this one. We've got to stop putting stumbling blocks in people's way where they're tripping over us and our preferences and our opinions when they're trying to get to Jesus. Christian, get out of the way of Jesus. Get in line behind him. We've got to focus where the main thing is the main thing. And Jesus came and he did away with all this other foolishness. I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to. But the show that Joshua referenced earlier that said that I often reference, one of my favorite lines in that show that I often reference is this one. Get used to different. That's what Jesus said in the show when he called Matthew and Peter said, we just don't do that. We don't, we don't, we're not seen with publicans, Peter's basically saying there. And Jesus looked at him and said, get used to different. Peter said, we're, we ain't never done it that way before, basically. Jesus says, get used to different. And I know that's not in the Bible, but... Folks, Jesus, get used to different. Too many times, too often, our churches are stuck in the rut of tradition and the way we've always done it in man-made philosophies and man-made opinions and man-made ways of doing things when you'll never find a bit of it in the Bible. Jesus comes along and blows it all to pieces. Get used to different. Let's, let's get focused where we need to. Jesus abolishes dead religion. Jesus, in verse 11, He shows His glory here. All the miracles, verse 11, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth His glory. All of the miracles had the purpose to point to the reality of who Jesus is as the Son of God. The word manifest here in this verse has the idea of shining a light on something for the purpose of revealing. It's like a spotlight here. The word manifestation manifested. It's like a spotlight came on Jesus revealing who He is. That's what this miracle is all about. It's pointing people to Jesus. It tells us right there in verse 11 that that's what this is all about. Manifesting forth His glory. What is His glory? It's, the, it's showing who He is as the Son of God. All that Jesus did, all that Jesus ever does was to point people to Him so that people could believe and come to salvation. And that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Are we supposed to be followers of Christ? We're supposed to be doing that which points people to Jesus and revealing to them who He is so that they can believe and be saved. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And then we see, thirdly here, it caused belief in Jesus. Verse 11, the end, and His disciples believed on Him. His disciples believed on Him. Whether this was the moment of salvation for them or if that had already happened, I, I don't know. That's between them and God. But there was a belief that took place. The disciples saw what happened. You can only imagine the servants that saw, witnessed it. There was an effect on them. A belief that happened. 
This miracle served its purpose as the disciples believed in him. They saw the person of the miracle, not the product. And that's where we get off on this. We're looking at the product rather than the person. It's all about Jesus. I should have titled that my my message title. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. They saw Jesus as the Son of God. So with all of this in consideration this morning as we think about these things, let me start off. Have you invited Jesus into your marriage? Have you invited Jesus into your marriage? Husbands and wives, maybe you need to commit your marriage to God. Husbands and wives, maybe you need to recommit your marriage to God. Have you seen the goodness of God in your life? Are you paying attention? Have you trusted in Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to give you a home in heaven? That's the purpose of all this miracle, everything that happened. Let me ask you, do you know for sure that you have a relationship with God based on what Jesus did at the cross? Do you know 100% sure that your sins are forgiven and that you have a relationship with God? If the answer this morning to that question is no, what's keeping you? What's keeping you from trusting a good and great Jesus and allowing Him to forgive your sins and to change your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. We'll have a, just a, again, a brief time of invitation to give you a chance to respond. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody's looking around, just me. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't, I don't know. I don't know 100% sure that I'm on my way to heaven. But I need to know. Would you raise your hand? Nobody's going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I just want to have the opportunity to, to be able to pray for you. You can raise your hand, slip it right up, and put it right back down. I don't know for sure, but I'd like to get that settled today. If that's you, please, please come and talk to me. Don't leave without getting this settled. Husbands, wives, take this time. Do I need to recommit myself to be the husband or to to be the wife that I ought to be? Do I need to recommit to have Jesus be a part of my marriage? Christian, are you living in the reality that Jesus is good, Jesus is great? Are you pointing people to Him with your life? Let's take just a moment here as the piano plays and let's pray where we are. Let's do business with God. Father, Lord, I love you and I thank you for your word. Thank you for how it speaks to us, but Lord, how it reveals who you are to us. It shows Jesus as the Son of God. Lord, this morning I ask that you would help each and every one of us this morning. Lord, that need this area in our life with regards to our marriage. God, that we would keep Christ at the center of our marriage that we would follow and do things the way that you would have us to do in our marriage. God, at work in our homes. God, I ask this morning that you would help us to live in the reality and the truth that you are good and you are great and you desire to do good in our lives. And God, that you can do great things in our lives. God, I ask that you would help those this morning that don't know you as their Savior, Lord, to get that settled this morning. Get that taken care of. They would know for sure. Lord, that we would put aside all these other things and focus in on what's important, that Jesus is the Son of God and that I can believe on Him and know for sure my sins are forgiven. God, do this work in us this morning. Help us to see You. Help us to point people to You and You only. I thank you for your desire and your willingness and your love to work in our hearts. 
I ask that you would. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought about leaving on the, my mask and just mouthing words to see if I could bug Brian on the sound, but I'll behave this morning. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, one is we have new scripture, uh, scriptures, John and Romans, in the scripture room now. So those of you that are involved or have been wanting to get involved, uh, they'll start the new project this Tuesday at 9 a.m. in the scripture building. Then uh, praise and pie night. Two requests I ask for you. One, bring a pie to share. Because if you don't, you're not safe. No, you're just, you're just not my friend that day. Um, water pots, yeah, water pots. You can bring a water pot too. Just bring a pie. And then second, if you could fill out a connection card, put uh, your favorite song, because we'll be singing several songs on that night. So by this Wednesday, if you guys could submit your favorite song that you'd like to sing for Praise and Pie Night, that would be good. So remember, December, December, ugh, November 24th, it's Praise and Pie Night. We'll meet here, and we'll go up to the uh, upper room. Uh, to do that. And then last but not least, ladies, sign painting party. Talk to Emily or uh, Holly if you have any questions and you want to attend. It is Friday, December 4th. There's my December date at 6.30. Uh, I assume it'll be next door. I probably scripts. Talk to them. I'm not part of that. So um, let's all stand. If you guys would remember, fill out those connection cards, drop them off in the back. There's also the uh, offering box if, the, if you felt led to to give this morning, and then uh, I will do one more plug since you've heard it twice. If you have not seen The Chosen, you need to watch The Chosen. Download it on your phone. It's an app, and then you can stream it to your TV. It is definitely worth your time. Let's pray and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a great day to be in your house. Uh, we pray that you'll protect us on the wet roads, but bring us back safely tonight as we continue to worship you and continue to fellowship as a family. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.